And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our lunchtime keynote guest speaker, tech entrepreneur, author, and passionate advocate of responsible innovation, decent work for everyone, and prosperity of immigrant talent. In STEM, our speaker is Sadia Muzaffar. Sadia is the founder of Tech Girls Canada, the hub for Canada's women in science, technology, engineering, and math, and co-founder of Tech Reset Canada, a group of business people, technologists, and other residents advocating for innovation focused on the public good. In 2017, she was featured as one of the most influential and groundbreaking women in Canada in the book, Canada 150 Women. And this year, she served as a Canadian delegate to the UN's 67th Commission on the Status of Women. Women. Sadia, we are so glad that you're here with us today. The the just the range of groups and and uh, experts that you have regular access to and touch points with is really compelling. And I know I know just from my own experience, the the perspective and insights you're going to share with our audience today are going to be fantastic. So welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for having me and that very kind introduction. Thank you also to the minister for the remarks. I think that it's uh, such a good segue for the conversation that we are about to have and that I'm excited to participate in um, going into uh, the Women's Summit. I think that lots of things are changing and change is often sometimes an uncomfortable process. So I'm hoping to have a rich conversation with you based on a lot of things that we are working on and learning. And um, I hope that when you walk away from, from this conversation, you will have um, lots of compelling data that will inspire you and convince you to take action uh, for a more inclusive economy. Thank you. Um, our conversations today is about getting serious, uh, about winning business with world-class talent. I'm going to share some data with you, and then we'll launch into our, our sort of discussion. This is from a UN report that was recently released. Did you know that while the majority of employers agree that migration benefits their access to talent, only 15% of organizations actively pursue global diversity in their hiring, and a mere 2% do it well. If you are an employer or entrepreneur who is surprised to hear these numbers or this status, you are not alone. So coming back closer to home in Canada, 90% of business leaders indicate that they have a diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy but only 33% say actual progress is being made. This is very telling. Again, we see here at home, while there is clear appetite and support for global talent, only one out of three organizations is doing enough to actually benefit from it. Why is that? So let's look at the business case for hiring immigrants. This is also from the UN report. 15% higher profitability in companies that have more immigrants in their leadership. 35% increase in financial returns in companies with top quartile ethnic and racial diversity. That's significant, 35%. 75% more likely to be world-class innovators if a company has more immigrants in their leadership. So you can see that the evidence in favor of making the progress that only one out of three Canadian businesses are pursuing is staggering. So why the gap? The UN report says this gap between intention and meaningful results comes down to three key reasons. It's not a strategic priority. Uh, it could be obstacles like visa issues, more logistical reasons. And the third one is perceived language and cultural barriers. Hold this thought because we're gonna come back to it later in our discussion. Let me tell you a little bit about TGC and why we are so excited to have this conversation with you and others across Canada. 
Uh, TGC is 10 years old this year. We are a research-focused organization, and we do original research and also design pilots with public and private organizations to test the strategies and insights that are gleaned from that research. We do it this way because we believe that this accelerates change. We also work with artists and communities to present our findings in beautiful, accessible, and compelling ways. We think that not everybody is excited every day to read white papers. So we think that we can do film and art and other ways of engaging people into meaningful dialogue and change. TGC is also the Canada Center of Excellence for Immigrant Women in STEM, who represent 52% of Canada's women in STEM workforce. We believe that improving economic equity for immigrant women in STEM will improve economic outcomes for all women in STEM. And we are committed to creating conditions of success that enable women of all colors, ages, and abilities to thrive. Now, let's come back home. Let, let's, let's talk about why this focus on immigrant women in STEM is so important. Canada's aging population means that the worker to retiree ratio is expected to shift from seven to one to two to one by 2035. We need people and we need younger people in our economy. For the last year or so, Canada's unemployment rate has been hovering around a historic low. Immigration accounts for almost 100% of Canada's labor force growth. And roughly 75% of Canada's population growth comes from immigration, mostly in the economic category. For those who might not know, the economic category is a points-based system a lot of STEM talent from all across the world ends up in Canada because our immigration system gives them particular incentives to come and make Canada home. Immigrants account for 36% of our physicians, 33% of our business owners with paid staff, and 41% of engineers. A whole lot of you are here today. Uh, thank you for joining this conversation. According to RBC, the cost of underutilizing skilled immigrants to Canada's economy is a staggering $50 billion each year. That's money that we're leaving on the table because we have not figured out how to integrate this international talent into our economy. A 2022 survey indicates that upwards of 30% of immigrants are considering leaving Canada in the next five years due to job dissatisfaction. It's a very global connected world out there and people have options now. And for us to lose a third almost of people who have been handpicked and brought over into Canada is a huge loss. And that loss climbs up to 49% when it comes to immigrant women. And you'll see in data why that number is so high that one out of every two women would leave if they could. This last one is really interesting. So the percentage of permanent residents obtaining Canadian citizenship has plummeted by 40% since 2001. So when we immigrate to Canada, there is a period of a few years where we have somewhat of a temporary status known as permanent residence, after which the Canadian government invites us to take the citizenship oath and become a Canadian resident. This drop of 40% indicates that immigrants particularly highly skilled immigrants, are not seeing a future for which they want to commit to Canada. And that is problematic for how much we rely on immigration and immigrant talent. Canada also ranks lower than I thought in recruiting skilled immigrant talent. We are behind Singapore, who is second, US, who is fourth, Australia, who is ninth. We are at number 15, which surprised me, and I bet would surprise a bunch of you too. Uh, so Canada needs to do a better job of not just recruiting, but retaining skilled immigrants. Or our increased economic class immigration targets become an opportunity lost instead of a gain. So let me bring you back to TGC's world. We really believe in the power and potential of immigrant women who are a significant part of this talent pool that is untapped. So our work is, is in two categories. One is visibility and advocacy work. A lot of you have heard about um, 
you know, programs to attract more women and girls into coding, into other STEM fields. It is rare that you would hear about immigrant women in those circles. And that's a problem because immigrant women are both hyper visible, as in when we enter a room, we cannot hide the fact that we are racialized, we have an accent, we might have a hijab, and we are also invisible. When we see economic policy, when we see um, job training uh, programs, we don't see specific programs addressing the barriers that immigrant women face in STEM. So there is a visibility issue that, that we are working on, and with it comes advocacy. But all of this needs to go hand in hand with systemic change work, which means that we have to map the interlocking roles of primary stakeholders, like government employers, such as a lot of you in attendance, uh, immigrant settlement agencies. And the systemic change work is slower than any one of us would like because the status quo is really comfortable uh, for a lot of people. Even if they want to change, they don't know the pathways forward. So a lot of our work at TGC is figuring out what a good on-ramp can be for people who express the intention but don't know how to get started. So when we started this work in 2017, there was no national snapshot of what we mean when we say immigrant women in STEM. We've been working with partners like Statistics Canada, and last year was the first time that national numbers were released by Statistics Canada uh, for their 2021 census reports. And it turns out that immigrant women are the majority of Canada's women in STEM at 52%. The number of immigrant women in STEM is also increasing year over year. So with higher immigration targets that we know that are upcoming up until 2025, we will see more and more of these women choosing to make Canada home because our immigration program says we need you, we need your talents, come and make Canada um, your destination. But these immigrant women have the worst labor market outcomes compared to either immigrant men or non-immigrant women, which is not a place where any category should be, but they seem to be at this intersection of gender, race, language, immigration status, where they have the worst outcomes. They have the highest unemployment rates compared to other groups. They have higher overqualification rates. And by overqualification, we mean underemployment. They're often in jobs where they are qualified to be at a higher position and taking care of bigger projects and more ambitious things that they are um, allowed to. Those with degrees from outside Canada have the highest underemployment rates, but disparities remain even for Canadian educated immigrant women in STEM. So if I'm an immigrant woman and I come to Canada and I go to a Canadian school, I will still end up in this data set of having poorer outcomes. Job matches lower for women in science, in engineering, in computer and information science, and there's a large wage gap, which over the course of our careers makes a huge difference, not just for our earnings, but for taxes paid, our GDP, and our contribution level. Now, here's a question. These are very talented well-trained, educated women who are landing in Canada, not as fresh graduates, they're bringing international experience. If you had access to a competitive advantage secret, wouldn't you do anything in your power to activate it for your business? I would think yes, right? Um, but as you would remember, you know, the, the three things, that the gap between intention and meaningful results were not taking advantage of what is in our own backyard. It is not a strategic priority for us. We have some obstacles that are logistical, but there is a lot that goes unchecked under perceived language and cultural barriers. Um, between friends, I wanna say something here which might be difficult for some people to hear. Uh, but I think it's important. I think Canada has a really hard time figuring out how to feel about immigrants. You know, our cultural sort of imagination really struggles here. A lot of immigrants will say that they are begrudgingly accepted. 
they're often doubted and suspected in terms of what value they bring, what education they've had, and what experience they show. And sometimes they're treated as though they don't have the right to belong and build a life here. And that makes for a difficult set of circumstances. Part of the reason why there is a gap is because in theory, we agree that we want change, but change in inclusion means that the power dynamic needs to change. Um, and that's difficult. But I do believe that over the years, a lot more people are open to exploring what can be done uh, to make these conditions better and more inclusive for everybody. So here are some recommendations to get you started on this journey. Hire and promote immigrant women for their potential. So research has shown that immigrant women are asked to show very specific prior experience rather than being assessed for their competence and potential, which means that when they are screened for that, they're, they're being screened out. We're looking for reasons to screen them out. So the thing to do would be to reassess your organization's approach to evaluating skills and competencies and taking into consideration international credentials, because assessing those would be different than somebody who's gone to Canada, a uh, Canadian institution. Instead of using rigid criteria, go for a learning mindset, passion for your organization and your mission, uh, and rich experiences in unusual settings. This brings resilience and innovation into your workforce, and that those are all assets in a knowledge-based economy. Invest in both active and passive talents pathways. Although mentorship and resume-based recruitment are useful tools, they are often not enough to amplify the power and potential of immigrant women in STEM. In sectors where workforces are attempting to correct gender disparities, these tools have been shown to consistently undervalue the skills and experiences of women and marginalized people. Launch an executive sponsorship program to have senior leaders actively invest in the development and advocacy for STEM-trained immigrant women within their circles of influence. Mentorship is good. Everybody loves giving women advice though, you know, but advice that works for other people might not work for women. So what we want is more, more of your skin in the game. We want you to step forward and vouch for us. Vouch for us in rooms where we are not present and you know, recommend us for projects, recommend us for new opportunities for training and investment. Create conditions of success for immigrant women. So there's a difference between removing obstacles and creating conditions of success for immigrant women in STEM. Conditions of success acknowledge the assets immigrant women in STEM bring and support their long-term growth and achievements. So you're not looking for a perfect fit right out of the gate, but you're investing in a person who is committed to the same values and the same ambitions that your organization is. So build an accountable framework of policies that ensure a safe, harassment-free, non-discriminatory workplace. Adapt human resources processes to migrants' needs. Those are specific and create opportunities for professional development to amplify their skills. So you might be thinking, how can you get started? There's a lot of organizations who are doing really, really good work. You can also take a smaller first step into learning more because I think that we need to do lots of unlearning and learning together. You can join TGC's learning community for employers where we do knowledge sharing and collaboration. This is based on a LinkedIn group. Most of you are already on LinkedIn. And we are recruiting for our cohort for September 2023 and February 2024. And our goal is to bring everybody together and host speaker panels and discussions and training sessions so that we can have some of these difficult and not so difficult conversations together and you know, learn learn to translate what all of these this data means in terms of our businesses. I am so excited to share more with you, and I hope to see a whole bunch of you in the learning community in the fall. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you, Sadia, Sadia, for that um, that great. I mean, I have to say there was some pretty pretty surprising data in there from. From my perspective, I, I wasn't expecting, you know, we 
at the Canadian Chamber, we we certainly uh, advocate for uh, the aggressive immigration targets, uh, mm -hmm. particularly for economic immigration uh, that our business community needs for talent. You know, and we have we have such a skills and talent need in the country. So, to see that we're we're not enabling and uh, reducing uh, some of those barriers, but also enabling the the people who are coming in in quite the way that we all imagine we are uh, mm -hmm. is is pretty compelling and and kind of shocking to be frank. So, um, just before we go in, we have we've had a couple of questions come in from the audience mm -hmm. here, and I just want to remind people there is an opportunity here to ask uh, Sadia some questions. So, uh, use the Q and A uh, section below uh, in your in your uh, monitor today, and we'll. Um, We'll, we'll bring those up and and uh, bring them to Sadia. So first I have, how does the barriers of recognizing foreign credentials play a role in making it difficult for companies to hire immigrant women? Great question, thank you. Um, credential recognition has been a rallying cry for decades now. If you go back and look at the research, we've known for a really long time um, that that's an issue. This is the part where we recommend that we, one, particularly for women, believe them. You know, when when they're showing up and applying for a job, just like everyone else in Canada, they shouldn't be screened out because they don't have very specific interviews. Like women have told us that they have been in the country for three weeks and they go into an interview and they're asked for Canadian experience. And... From their resume, it's very clear that they've been here three weeks. And it's a strange question to ask and then screen somebody out for, right? Uh, so I, I think that there are lots of small and big places within the recruitment uh, process where we can go and interrogate it from the intention of what if we wanted to actually recruit these women instead of screening them out? You know, don't screen them out because they have an ethnic sounding name. Don't screen them out because they have an accent. All these things that I think we don't perhaps publicly admit, but are certainly part of the gap because that's the only thing that explains why, you know, the, the government is bringing in more of these people and less of them are making into our workforce. So I think there's opportunity everywhere in employment recruitment and retention to revisit some of the work that we do because it is not the same thing to hire people who have international uh, education and experience as it is for you know the process that works here. Right, thank you. Um, maybe to build off of that, then I'm aware that uh, a couple of provinces, and I think coming out of the pandemic and the challenges faced there, uh, in particular, uh, a couple of provinces are experience, uh, experimenting with foreign credential recognition, they particularly are. in in healthcare fields mm -hmm. for obvious reasons, but also in engineering and other areas. Um, yes, is that uh, to you? Is that the right approach? Are there are, are there promising developments there? Is this something that you're tracking? We are tracking this, and I think that it's um, it's a good first step. And I say this with cautious optimism, only because Matthew. Um, I think that we, when we have a cultural hesitancy, it shows up in ways that are not in an employment manual, right? So this is why I start with, we have to change. We have to change how we think of uh, immigrant talent in Canada. But I think it's really promising to actually name the problem and say we're, we're not going to allow for it. Uh, but it has to go further. Like that's not the only place where people get screened out, but that's a big place. And we're excited to see where this goes. Great, thank you. And and we'll be there with you uh, watching that because it has some promising, uh, I think opportunities for the country writ large. Yes. Uh, another question from the audience here, uh, Sadia, is uh, can you share some of the challenges immigrant women in STEM specifically experience in the Canadian workplace? Ah, how much time do you have? Yeah, I know it's a question big one. Asker. <laughs> um, I think the Canadian experience one comes up often. The other one, the reason why we at TGC particularly ran a pilot last year, we ran three cohorts. It's called Catalyst, and it is interrogating the role of resume-based recruitment. And we do this because a resume, like any other tool, has limitations, right? It's a chronological list of all the things that you've done. Everything is kind of the same size and importance when you list it like that. Um, and the problem with 
uh, that kind of a tool being the only entryway into a job market is immigrant women often say that they apply to 40 to 50 jobs a day and don't hear back. So you can imagine doing that for six months a year, your spirit gets really broken. You start to doubt just because you're not getting any feedback to say, oh, improve this. This was the thing that was wrong. So they don't know what's going on. Um, and it's an incredibly isolating experience. And what they feel is they're doing something wrong, but nobody would tell them what it is. Because obviously Canada said, come, we really need you. We have a skill shortage here and, and you have the skills that we need. And then they land here and they don't know what went wrong. Like there is there is a, a little bit of a bait and switch, which mm -hmm. is incredibly disorienting and confusing. Um, so those sorts of challenges are not simple as you can imagine to address, right? They're, they're not getting feedback. We actually released a short film. It's about five minutes. It's called um, We Were Here All Along. I would encourage you to go to techrolls.ca and watch that. Um, and I think that it explains a lot of both tactical challenges, which is I don't know how to know how to what to do better. And some, you know, cultural challenges where they have the skills that they that the companies need, but they are rejected for, oh, I don't think you're a cultural fit. And that, mm -hmm. again, is a fuzzy, squishy thing. What does that mean for a person? So many red flags around that. Story. So many red flags, right? <laughs> so um, yeah. I think that this is why starting to talk about it uh, more openly is really important because a lot of people, I think, don't even, they're so immersed in this way of doing business and recruitment that they might not even realize that they're perpetuating these um, barriers from their own work, right? Mm -hmm. One of the most compelling things that I often think about is we want more women in STEM, right? Most HR departments are headed by women. Mm -hmm. So nobody is, you know, uh, without uh, playing a part in, in this situation. So it's not even so much gender specific as it is process. But to me, that's exciting. We can fix process, right? Like if we all agree that this is not leading to the outcomes that we need, that we are all losing, Canada's losing, our economy is losing, the person, the community. Why are we doing this? Why why don't why don't we change? And I think right. it's such a good invitation to revisit some of the things that we kind of take for granted. That's great. We have I think looking at the clock, we're pretty close to time, but we have I'd love to put this one question up. It's it's had a number of votes. We've the audience has warmed up and we've had a number of questions come in, but this one it's a it's a personal question in a way, and it and it also I think uh, leans towards a a call to action, which I I think would be a great place to to end uh, this session with. So DEI is something I am deeply passionate about. Writes our uh, our question uh, asker. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. How best can someone like me, an associate at a bank, help? I want to be an ally, and my family are immigrants. Thank you for that question. Um, I think one of the biggest things that we can do is to raise this issue within our communities uh, and in our workplaces. It's kind of a little bit scary to do because I remember for the first 15 years when I was in Canada, I never, ever, ever mentioned that I was an immigrant in like a workplace situation, um, which is so funny to me because I think all immigrants are trying to really fit in so that they can get all the opportunities that are available to others. But in all the rooms that I was in, obviously everybody knew that I was an immigrant. I knew that they knew that I was an immigrant. So we also need to step in and, and do some changing here. And power dynamics only change when we, you know, collectively with solidarity, step into these rooms and talk about them. Um, TGC is very interested in this kind of work. So one of the things that we're doing is that short film. We have a facilitation guide and you can do a lunch and learn at your workplace and lead the people through. You have questions. There's just discussion. I think that we need to name things because once we name things, we can change them. When we measure things, we can change them. So in Matthew saying that some of the data surprised uh, them, I I think that it's because we haven't been measuring, but now we know the scale and scope of both what we stand to lose and what we can gain 
Uh, and I think all these conversations can lead to sustained change, right? Um, and then, of course, to back people when they tell us uh, that they need help and support. Well, as I thought, a great a great point to end on, and and uh, that that call out that we all have uh, a role to play here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Sadia Muzaffar, the founder of Tech Girls Canada, I think uh, I think everybody here in the audience uh, probably joins me in wishing that we'd had longer for this conversation today. But um, thank you so much for uh, for joining us and and being part of this. You've contributed a lot. That data is truly compelling. So I encourage everybody to find. Uh, the site online and uh, and see some of the work that you're doing to organize uh, the the learning community you mentioned as well. So yes. thank Immigrant you so women much. Immigrantwomeninstem.org. Immigrantwomeninstem.org. Thank you again. Thank you.